Washington Journal continues. A focus on federal spending now with Jonathan Bidlack of the R Street Institute. He's a program director there. The government's program previously helped found the Coalition to Reduce Spending and recently penned this piece for the National Review. Uh, get ready for a big spending lame duck. Jonathan Bidlack, uh, what are we likely to be spending big on in this upcoming lame duck? <laughs> well, what aren't we likely to be spending big on, I guess, is the better question. Um, I mean, look, it's sort of become, I think, this annual process where Congress doesn't finish, uh, you know, having their appropriations bills done on time. And so we tend to have an, an omnibus piece of legislation that uh, sort of rolls them all together uh, during the lame duck. That's, I think, what everyone is expecting this time around, obviously. Um, Congress, uh, you know, basically approved funding for the government through December 16th. And so there's a need to basically uh, either pass a, a continuing resolution that will extend it into the, the new Congress um, or to try to go and have some sort of omnibus piece of legislation. Um, there are all sorts of other things. I mean, we haven't finished the National Defense Authorization Act, for example. So there's a lot of work being done on the defense budget for the coming year. And there's a lot of lobbying going on from both special interests outside Washington, uh, but also just uh, from the Pentagon itself wanting to have uh, have an increase in their funding. So, uh, and then there's all sorts of other priorities, the um, Electoral Count Act reforms, uh, you know, we saw this, the same-sex marriage bill yesterday. So there's a lot of things that I think Congress has been putting off that now they're sort of all cramming into this uh, quickly shortening lame duck period. In terms of an omnibus, what kind of price tag are we talking about here if that's what does come together? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big wild card. I don't know that anyone knows at this point. Um, I, you know, obviously it's to fund the entire government. So typically speaking, there will be some significant increase. You have a lot of government departments that are obviously, we're in an inflationary environment. So uh, they're basically lobbying for increases in their budgets, perhaps even and even bigger than usual. So uh, I think it will likely be large. Now, if they can't get a deal, if the president can't get a deal, then the talk is that he'll, he'll potentially uh, support a continuing resolution through the entire year, which is something that hasn't typically been done. And that's where you're getting some of this pushback from you know, the Defense Department in particular. And the pushback is the Defense Department saying, we can't uh, respond to priorities that come up if we're working under the budget that was approved last time. Uh, department heads of different agencies make the same argument that continuing res resolutions tie their hands What's your view of a continuing resolution? You know, I think it's a little bit of uh, maybe a, a full of sound and fury signifying nothing, if you will. Um, I think that, um, you know, first of all, there are, there's a lot of funding that's available for multi-years. And, and many of the larger programs that the DOD in particular goes and funds, is they're not reliant on on sort of the, the funding they get on an annual basis. They have they have pools of money that are more appropriate. Um, so, you know, and, 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 and frankly, the GAO did a report, I think about a year and a half ago now, that, that looked at, you know, does DOD suffer under continuing resolutions, and they found no examples of any programs at DOD that uh, uh, that were sort of uh, put on the back burner because of the fact they weren't getting reliable funding. I mean, the reality is we have continuing resolutions pretty much, again, you know, every year. So it's not like this is some sort of new process that they haven't been able to plan for. So I think when you combine the evidence from, from GAO with the fact that this has become sort of a regular occurrence, it makes me think that this is not really a legitimate concern. This time after a new Congress is elected, but before they're seated, the lame duck, uh usually a time for big spending. Is this unusual that this would be a big spending lame duck? No, and it's become, I think, the, the, the norm. You know, I mean, obviously we passed the 20th Amendment in the 1930s as a way of kind of cutting down on the lame duck period. I mean, if you recall, the, the Constitution says that, you know, inauguration date, I think, is March 4th. And so, you know, we basically took two months off of that since we no longer have people, you know, traveling from California, I guess, uh, uh, you know, in, in old forms of transportation. But um, the, the goal then was to reduce the lame duck period for this exact reason, that you tend to get policies where there's a little bit less accountability because you just had the election. You know, it's two years. A lot happens in two years where voters sort of forget what may have happened in the lame duck. And so um, so it's become this time where perhaps on the potentially good end, you can do things that there might otherwise not be the political will to do, you know, things like the ECA reform that I mentioned. But the other problem is that you end up having a lot of these big spending priorities where basically everyone can kind of go and, uh, you know, get their get their hands in the cookie jar and, uh, uh, and increase spending in a way that they otherwise might not be able to. When a chamber of Congress changes hands, what's the incentive for the party that's coming into power mm -hmm. to agree to big spending in a lame duck? 
R well, right. I mean, so right now, obviously, Democrats have the majority, right, and they're losing the House. And so from their end, it's, it's quite obvious, right, they want to get all of these priorities. Right, but from the Republican end. Right, and, and that's why you're hearing, I think, a lot of the messaging on the Republican side. But there are still certain things that Republicans do want to see funded, right? The DOD budget is a good example of that since we're talking about that. So so there are, there are these kinds of priorities. And then there are other things where I think there is just a diversity of opinion within the Republican Party in this case. Um, you know, again, the the Electoral Count Act, right, which isn't necessarily a, isn't a spending bill, but it's something that that there there are people on the Republican side of the aisle who want to go and see that reform be passed, and so uh, this is an an, you know, an enticing time to kind of take up a reform like that. And so uh, I think the same thing goes with, on the on the spending front is that there are certain things, right? There are always priorities that that both parties want, and and frankly, when you look at their their spending records or what they vote for, there's actually a lot more bipartisanship than than you might think. I mean, the reality is that both parties, uh, you know, to, to pass pretty much anything these days, you generally have to have some level of bipartisanship, especially when Congress is so close in margin. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot more agreement, I think, than, than sometimes we're led to believe. Jonathan Bidlack is our guest, a government's program director at the R Street Institute, here to take your calls as we talk about congressional spending and these upcoming fiscal deadlines. Phone lines are, as usual, Democrats 202-748-8000, Republicans 202-748-8001. Independence 202 748 8002. Uh, as folks are calling in, explain what the R Street Institute is, what the government's program does. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we're a center right think tank. Uh, our tagline is supporting uh, uh, free markets. And so um, you know, we basically try to pr present a, a limited government perspective and sort of real solutions to some of the policy problems that, uh, that are being faced in Washington. The governance program in particular does work on a whole host of issues. We try to make, uh, you know, Congress have better oversight over the executive branch, have Congress uh, uh, work better in general. We've done a lot of work with the Modernization Committee, for example, at trying to, to bring Congress into the, into the, new, uh, the new century, if you will. So, um, so basically just trying to make the government work better so that uh, we all get better policy. What is SpendingTracker.org? Sure. So Spending Tracker is a site that basically takes official government estimates from the Congressional Budget Office, um, and, and it cross-references those estimates with the voting records of members of Congress. So you can go on that site, you can uh, pull up your member and see exactly what they've voted for and what the fiscal implications of that legislation are. So uh, it's a kind of a really great resource. I think a lot of times, you know, you have members from both parties who say one thing and they perhaps do something different with their votes, and so this is the ability to kind of go and compare members and really see whether or not uh, their actions on on fiscal bills, uh, how they actually compare to, uh, to you know, the reality. In terms of tracking spending, uh, a headline from the New York Times today, the U.S. pledges $53 million to Kiev for their electrical grid. Mm -hmm. How much are we up to at this point in spending on the war in Ukraine? Yeah, it's it's a lot. Uh, this is going to be, I think, the uh, the third package, assuming that something happens during the lame duck. Uh, you know, I believe President Biden has been asking for another thirty-seven billion this time around. Um, you know, this is uh, this is thirty-seven again, billion on top of. This that may be that may be a newer number now. Okay. Now. Yeah, but I think that uh, the 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 thing is the um, obviously the, this is to your point, your question from earlier about where there's agreement. I think there are a lot of Republicans, obviously, in, you know, Mitch McConnell, for example, being at the top of, at the top of that list who wants to see increased funding for Ukraine in addition to President Biden. I think there's some concern on the Democratic side of the aisle that once Republicans take over, they might not have the votes in the House to be able to go and support Ukraine uh, more in the future. And so hence the reason for taking up that issue in the context of the lame duck. I don't have the U.S. number, but the Wall Street Journal notes that NATO countries together have so far provided $40 billion in weaponry to Ukraine. That's roughly the size of France's annual defense budget. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I think this is clearly a, a proxy battle that's going on, uh, uh, you know, on the part of a number of countries, and uh, so yeah, it's a this is a, obviously a, a priority for many for many members. One other topic before we get to calls, the debt limit. Yeah. When does that hit? Remind us what that is again. Yeah, so another another great example. So it, it doesn't actually hit until next year. Um, so the debt limit is essentially a, uh, you know, a, the, the, the limit beyond which uh, Congress then has to subsequently approve uh, the ability to, to borrow more, the bar borrowing authority of the country. Um, you know, I think a lot of Democrats, again, are concerned that Republicans might, quote, you know, hold the debt limit hostage or hold the, the full faith and credit of the country hostage um, uh, by not raising the debt limit, uh, given that we have a Democratic president next year. Uh, I, so hence the reason for wanting to take it up now. I think that um, there's an argument to be made that many of the best fiscal deals that we've gotten have actually been in the context of some of these debt limit fights. So uh, I don't particularly think that that's a, a strong argument. But What's an a, example of one of those deals that was a good one? 
Well, I mean, the Budget Control Act of 2011 was, I think, the, the most recent great example. We had we had caps on, on discretionary spending. It created expectations for where spending should be over the course of the next decade. We had agreement generally from both parties. Yes, there were sort of, uh, you know, times where the debt, where the, the those budget caps were raised and adjusted and so on along the way. But um, there's a lot of evidence that we had more responsible fiscal outcomes under President Obama and a Republican Congress than we otherwise would have had if we hadn't had uh, that, that deal coming out of the, the debt limit fight in the, in the early uh, 2010s. Calls for you. Susan's up first. Kentucky, Republican. Susan, you're on with Jonathan Bidlack. Howdy, sir. Um, I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. You too. And I was wondering, when people say that there's going to be a government shutdown, exactly how many government people are going to be shut down? Yeah, it's a good question. And there are obviously parts of the government that are deemed essential. And we've had uh, increasing amounts of the government be deemed essential over time. Uh, so, you know, there are there are certain things that are that are subject to a shutdown and there are certain things that are that are not. So uh, it's uh, it, to some degree, it is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not like everything in Washington is just immediately shutting down. And and as we know from past experience, there's, uh, you know, tended to be this willingness to be a little bit more political with shutdowns where, you know, maybe you close national parks or things that have, uh, you know, that interface directly with the public as a way of creating political pressure uh, to. Uh, uh, you know, have them, uh, you know, have, have pictures them, of the signs closed outside of Yellowstone. Ex exactly. And so, uh, so, you know, there is a little bit, again, of uh, it, it is a bit of a misnomer. And I think that uh, how it plays out in practice, to some degree, there's a little bit more uh, maybe discretion there than, than, you know, we might like to admit. Good question from Tillman on Twitter. What is the government program that has seen the biggest cost reduction in the last decade? And he also wants to know what program has grown the most? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, if you look at where, why the national debt has expanded so dramatically, there are a couple of factors at play. One is just entitlement spending or so-called direct spending. You know, here you have these programs that are essentially on autopilot. They're not voted on or reviewed by Congress on an annual basis. Uh, and so you end up having, you know, a, a significant increase to the national debt and to outlays from the federal government, as in particular the baby boomers have have retired. And so that's been particularly, I think, a, a, a troubling issue. And it's something that, you know, I really wish that that members of both sides would come together and uh, and and you know address. I mean, we've had other countries, Sweden, for example, which had a an entitlement crisis in the '90s, and they and they dealt with it uh, and they came together, even though they had a, a pretty generous uh, social welfare program. How did um, they deal with it? Uh, well, I mean, they, they they imposed fiscal rules that that essentially restricted or limited how much they were able to spend based on how much tax revenue they had coming in. And so there are a lot of countries. Switzerland is perhaps the gold standard, where you know we we all know that Switzerland has a really great uh, fiscal system, and there's a reason why Swiss banks are a thing, for example, and it's because they tend to be very responsible with their country's finances, and and they've done that because they have these fiscal rules that in place that that basically limit what they're able to spend and not sort of borrow or go beyond go beyond their means. Um, you know, there are other portions of the budget that have obviously exploded. I mean, when we think about wars, right, or the, or the, the, the budget for the, uh, uh, for the Pentagon, I mean, we're seeing, you know, the, the National uh, Defense Authorization Act. You know, I think it, it's plausible to think that we'll be over a trillion dollars in a reasonably short amount of time. And that's kind of mind boggling to think that we'd be spending over a trillion dollars on, on the Pentagon on an annual basis. So uh, there are a lot of things like this, I think, that do need to be addressed outside of the, the mandatory spending problem. Speaking of the Pentagon, Rebecca, on Twitter, the Pentagon can't pass an audit. Uh, an audit. They've been trying for three years. Uh, what's going on with that? Yeah, it's super critical, and uh, and this is something that uh, that I and our street have done a lot of work on through the years. I mean, you know, before you can kind of go and and really get your spending under control, you really need to know where it's going. And so, uh, you know, other parts of the government are required to do an audit. I think it's a very fundamental thing in the private sector that people are obviously very familiar with. And so, um, you know, I I would much rather. Uh, I think that's a, a great starting point. I think it's something that that members from both sides, regardless of your feelings on what the top line budget of the Pentagon should be. It's the kind of thing that I think should bring people together. Um, and it generally has. There's a lot of support on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but it is something that obviously there is a, a, there's always resistance um, anytime you're trying to go and, uh, and reform an agency or department from within. To Dave out of New Madison, Ohio, an independent, you're on with Jonathan Bidlack. Yeah. Uh, you hear me? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
what I'd like to know is when the government has a shutdown, <coughs> is there any truth to it that the government still gets paid when they have the shutdown? Well, uh, it, it depends on it depends on who, I guess, right? I mean, as I as I said earlier, there are certain people who uh, who are deemed essential. Um, you know, the reality is that in in hindsight, uh, usually, uh, you know, the government always reopens, and we tend to go and and you know pay people uh, for the time that the government was shut down. So uh, that that's usually how it works. So. In the short term, there is still obviously pain for government workers who aren't necessarily or potentially not getting a paycheck. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, everyone ends up getting their uh, getting their money at the end of the day. And speaking of getting money at the end of the day, uh, something we always watch at the end of the year: tax extenders. Yeah. Uh, efforts to extend uh, various tax loopholes to different parts of of the economy. Yep. Is that happening again this year? Is that going to happen? It's certainly something that's being talked about. There's obviously, <laughs> a lot of people who want to see that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so yes, I think that's I think that's plausible. Again, the the laundry list of things that people want to see addressed during the lame duck uh, is getting longer by the day, even though the the, the time period of the lame duck perhaps is uh, is getting shorter. What are some of those tax extenders you've tracked in the past? Uh, we tend not to focus on on taxes as much as we do on the expenditure side, just because of the fact that that you know when you look at why Washington has sort of the the, the problem with the national debt that we do, it tends to be driven so much more by uh, by the spending side of the ledger than it does the, the tax side. Um, you know when you look at, for example, uh, President Biden's record over the last two years. Uh, you know, he's actually uh, spent more or sort of, you know, essentially set in motion more spending than President Trump did in his last two years at the height of the COVID pandemic, which was actually, you know, people don't necessarily talk about this, but President Trump was the, <coughs> the biggest spending spending president, more so than President Obama and, and, and President Bush. And so um, and so now you move into this, into the, the new presidency. I think um, President Biden has largely continued the legacy that existed with, with President Trump. You know, you have all these sort of, you know, obviously a lot of this has been, was COVID related um, in the early stages of his presidency, but we've ha had other things like infrastructure, like the CHIPS Act, all of these kinds of other, uh, of other bills, even the Inflation Reduction Act actually increases uh, uh, spending <coughs> over time. And so, uh, or at least in the immediate term. And so, uh, you know, to me, that's where a lot of the, the problem is. Obviously, the, the tax side does impact the budget. You, you do have things where uh, reducing revenue it has, a, has a significant impact on, uh, on the national debt. But the true driver is largely our sort of bipartisan willingness to continue, continue to spend. Put some numbers to that comparison to the, the Trump administration and the Biden administration comparison. Sure. So in the last two years of, of, of Trump's term, uh, you know, he set in motion, according to official CBO estimates and, and spending tracker, <laughs> uh, about $3.3 trillion in new spending. You contrast that now with the Biden administration, which I believe is over $3.7 trillion now. Even though we're obviously at a much different stage of the pandemic, we don't necessarily have the need to be spending in this way. And, and obviously, we've had these other, these other priorities. So, uh, you know, and I, and I believe one estimate has said that the, the Biden administration so far has borrowed uh, $4.8 trillion. And that's because it's not just the spending that's been voted on by Congress, but also a lot of the executive orders. When you look at things like the uh, student loan forgiveness, or changes to the uh, to the SNAP program, for example, these things are very expensive too, and sometimes being kicked into motion by executive order. So, uh, so you have this very significant uh, spending legacy, and and I think it's uh, you know unfortunate at a time where you know inflation is obviously the biggest economic concern for the majority of Americans, and and you know the fiscal policy is not the only part of that, but it's a significant part of that, and you want fiscal policy generally to be working together with monetary policy, and we have. The Federal Reserve raising interest rates to tamp down on inflation, but then we still have Washington spending a lot on the fiscal side, and that creates sort of a, 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 a disconnect, I think, between those two. Back to the phones. This is John in Pennsylvania, Democrat. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. You're on with Jonathan Bidlight. Yes, Democrat. What's your question or comment? Oh, um, yeah, I'd like to see uh, some of the richer folks pay some federal tax. They boast about a big uh, military, and that's what we need, something, you know, uh, to bring some of the cost down. For the rich to pay more taxes? Uh, their fair share, not more. What do you consider fair share, John? Um, I pay federal taxes every week out of my paycheck. I mean, uh, I don't know. Um, 
some of the American people would like to see some of that. John the Bidlack, what's a fair share? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that's the rub. I mean, you know, the IRS had some new statistics come out uh, last week uh, on sort of who is paying taxes. Um, and what you find is, I, I believe, for the first time in our nation's history, the top 2% of wage earners now uh, pay more than 50% of, of all income taxes in this country. So that's top 2% is paying more than half. Uh, that's really significant. And I, I, you know, I think that sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect between what people think um, you know, the wealthy are paying and what they may actually be paying. Um, I think most of us agree, you know, that there's there's obviously a, a rationale for a progressive tax system. But the reality is that the, the spending that, we're, that we have, the expenditures that we have, um, are so dramatic that there's there's only so much squeezing of the of those higher uh, you know income cohorts that you really can can do and so um, you kind of have a choice that's gonna gonna I think become increasingly uh, important which is either you have to start to go and restrain and be more responsible on the expenditure side or you're probably going to have to raise taxes not just on the wealthy but on the middle class and even on people who don't necessarily uh, pay taxes to be able to go and and pay for a lot of these programs and so uh you know sometimes i think the the perception as to what the actual tax base looks like um is actually radically different from from what it actually is a few minutes left with jonathan bidlack of the r street institute if you want to join the conversation democrats 202 748 republicans 202 748 Independence, 202-748-8002. Uh, a big question from Mark Stone. We could probably do uh, the rest of the show on this. Social Security and Medicare depletion date is 2035. What reforms should occur and what politician or party wants to address it? Yeah, well, I mean, to take that second question, I mean, the reality is nobody wants to address it. And and I do think it is unfortunate, as I said earlier. I mean, I think that, you know, there are other countries that have similar arrangements um, that have actually managed to go and, and you know, get their fiscal house in order. Uh, and so we have seen cases where, you know, social Democrats have been able to come together with, with you know, fiscal conservatives in, the, in those places um, and make the kind of reforms that are necessary. I think that, unfortunately, in this country, we've been hesitant to do so um, because it's just become so politicized and these issues are sort of the third rail. Um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of things, uh, this, again, we could, we could talk for hours on this. Um, I think that, you know, what I will say is that, you know, in, in the healthcare space, um, obviously that is one of the areas where the government is the most heavily involved. And I think that there's a lot of evidence that there are ways to get the government uh, less involved that could actually go and have a positive impact on healthcare costs. Because it's not just the existence of the program that's the problem, it's the fact that healthcare spending in general is going up dramatically. And, you know, there's that chart that gets shared around on Twitter all the time about how, you know, many of the things that the government is involved in the most are the things where we're seeing price increases. Um, and then areas where, where prices are going down, there tends to be a little bit less of that involvement. So I think that's one area to look at. Um, I think on Social Security, I mean, it's largely a money in and a money out problem. And so, um, you know, again, it, like many other things, you only have a couple of choices. It's either, it's either raise taxes or it's change the way that, uh, uh, that benefits are being paid out. And I would say that the latter, you know, is probably the better way to go. I mean, the reality is that Social Security wasn't, you know, intended to be a source of a source of income for 40 plus years when it was instituted. And that's the reason why we're having a lot of these challenges that we're having now. And so I think that not, not unfortunately, not raising, uh, you know, the retirement age is probably not, um, there's no real way to do that without really substantial increases in payroll taxes. Like I said, we could probably do the rest of the show <laughs> on that topic. To the Evergreen State, this is Evan in Bremerton, Democrat. Good morning. Hi, good morning, guys. Um, I just want to talk about, like, this discussion you're having this morning. Something I noticed is that you said um, Republicans want more military spending, but it, it's not okay to spend on Ukraine. So Republicans are huge hypocrites about that. Uh, my second point is France, they spend 50% more on social spending than the United States does. And the difference between the United States and France is that France can actually make planes that fly. Uh, well, a lot, I think a lot of things we could talk about there. I mean, you know, uh, first of all, I mean, I do think it's important to recognize that the United States is, is generally much wealthier than many European countries. Uh, and so, you know, there is a trade-off there, right? You have more, more generous uh, uh, social spending, 
Um, but but generally speaking, right, uh, you know, people in Europe are worse off economically speaking than they are in the United States. That's not to say that there isn't substantial hardship, of course, and huge amounts of inequality among different cohorts. But generally speaking, you know, that we, we are in a better position and it's a trade off that we've made, I think, as a country. Um, with respect to the Pentagon budget, I mean, I agree with you. I think that, you know, look, I mean, we should be applying the same kind of fiscal responsibility that we demand in uh, in uh, other parts of the, of the government to the Pentagon as well. And I think that there's generally been this attitude that just spending more on the Pentagon ends up resulting in, in making us safer and, and, and better, uh, you know, national defense outcomes. And I don't think that's true. I, I would argue quite strongly that imposing a budget constraint actually forces you to more stringently consider what your priorities are uh, and to weigh those trade-offs more effectively. And I personally would make that argument if we're talking about you know, uh, the, the Farm Bill or the, the Department of Education, uh, as well as the Department of Defense. On planes and the part of, uh, Department of Defense, Remind us about the F-35 program. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a classic example, right, of something that, that uh, you know, was a plane that people wanted uh, for a number of purposes. They, they didn't really scope it out, perhaps, as well as they should. And like many of these programs, the cost has just increased dramatically. Uh, and so, uh, you know, now we're kind of in this bucket where, on the one hand, it's a sunk cost, but on the other hand, it's probably more expensive to start all over. And so we're constantly dealing with a plane that, you know, uh, I mean, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek say can't fly. It and fly, but has a lot of issues with it, um, and it's taxpayers that end up being on the hook when these things don't go and work properly. And so I think that's a, a classic example where where we really need to go. And I think uh, you know the, the planning at the front end is so so important to ensuring that these cost overruns don't happen down the road. Last call, Lewis in Evansville, Indiana, line for Democrats. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Doing well. Go ahead. Uh, there's a pie chart in the back of the federal income tax book. And personal income tax, and Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment taxes bring in 45% of our income. Corporate income taxes is only 3% of what we take in. How come corporate income taxes is not a little higher? Well, uh, it's a great question, uh, and again, you know, one point to make there is that I think that sometimes when people look at the corporate income tax, they think that, you know, people are over here and corporations are over there. But the reality is that in many cases, corporations are, all they do with that, with, with increases in the corporate tax is pass it along to consumers. So it's not necessarily clear that we would be better off by raising the corporate tax. And then you also have to consider from the standpoint of, you know, we have many businesses now are basically multinationals. They can choose where they're based. The ability to be competitive on the world stage is very much driven by your corporate tax rate. So um, there is there are a lot of other factors here to consider that beyond sort of just the short term. And, and it's not obvious that, that over the long term that raising the corporate income tax would ultimately result in more more money to the government if you end up having more business, businesses moving overseas, um, you know, or or again the ability to pass those taxes off to consumers. Jonathan Bidlack is the governance program director at the R Street Institute. It's rstreet.org where you can see his work. Appreciate your time. Come back again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Up next, the National LGBTQ Task Forces. Kiera Johnson joins us to discuss the Respect for Marriage Act that was passed in the Senate yesterday. Stick around. We'll be right back.